To kick off our unit on electricity, we're going to start out by talking about some of the key electrical properties and defining them so that when we get to them later on, it'll be just second nature. So um, very simply, we're going to be looking at these four, voltage, current, resistance, and power. If you remember back to our energy unit, we talked about potential energy, kinetic energy, um, and other different forms of energy. Well, potential energy was essentially just energy that is stored up in some fashion. So gravitational potential energy was energy that was stored up based on position uh, from gravity. Elastic potential energy was energy that was stored up by distorting some sort of elastic band or spring. What we're gonna talk about today is electrical energy, electrical potential energy which is ultimately going to give us a voltage. Voltage is the potential energy difference between two different locations. Because of that, sometimes uh, you might see voltage being described instead as potential difference. So you might see PD uh, designating voltage in the same way that you would typically see voltage being used. When we're going to talk about voltage, we'll use the symbol capital V in any sort of equation that we see. And then the unit for voltage is simply volts, which is also a capital V. Um, you've probably seen voltage in a variety of different situations. Uh, most commonly, you'll see voltage in a battery. Uh, spelled out, a 9-volt battery obviously has 9 volts. All of these other cells have 1.5 volts, um, and that's kind of counterintuitive because they are different sizes and different applications. Um, they have different amounts of overall energy, but the difference energy potential energy difference uh, from both sides is going to be the same one and a half volts for each of these different sizes. A car battery is usually around 12 volts, uh, and the electricity coming out of your wall is going to have a potential difference voltage of 120 volts here in the U.S. Current is going to be the rate at which charges move through a conductor. Um, the charges that are going to be moving that we'll talk about are electrons. So when we talk about current, we're talking about a flow of electron charges through some sort of conductor. Current is the same word that we use to describe the flow of other things as well. Like you could talk about the current through a river, and we'll use that analogy of water flowing later on in this unit to talk about current, which is something that we can't see, uh, and comparing it to something that we can Current in an equation, we're going to use a symbol of a capital I. Um, C is used for other things like capacitance uh, and charge and coulombs. So current, we're going to use capital I in our equations, which is not something that you would typically guess. Uh, the unit for current is one of our seven SI units. That's the ampere. Um, it's abbreviated with a capital A, and often we'll just talk of, uh, describe them using amps. So you would say that there is two amps of current flowing through a wire. Now, it's important to think about why the electrons are flowing and not the protons or neutrons. Uh, if you remember back to your chemistry, you should remember that protons have charge just like electrons do. So you could have a flow of charges if protons are moving through, but protons are fixed in the atoms themselves. So if a current is flowing through a copper wire, the atoms of the copper wire are where the electrons are coming from. They're not coming all from a battery. The electrons already exist. So this diagram here shows a really nice um, depiction of what's going on. It's not necessarily electrons following in a line. Um, the electrons are part of these atoms and a voltage being applied just pushes those electrons in one direction here. So the electrons being on the outside of the atom are much more easily transferred um, and you're able to transfer them without physically changing the atom structure of the material. The electrons can jump from atom to atom and flow through a wire. Our third property is resistance. Resistance is how difficult it is for electrons to flow. The symbol for this is a capital R and we're going to use the unit of ohms to measure resistance. Uh, ohms, our abbreviation, is a capital omega symbol, uh, which kind of looks like a horseshoe or a rainbow with feet. So resistance is how hard it is for these electrons to actually travel through. Now, you could have resistance for electricity or resistance for water flow, like the analogy we, we used before. 
if we're talking about water flow, a resistance is going to be based on how large of a diameter the, the pipe or the hose is that you're trying to flow that water. So this garden hose is going to have a lot more resistance than this oil pipeline. It's a lot harder to flow water through a tiny area than it is through a larger area. We see the same sort of thing for electricity. A very thick extension cable has much less resistance than a tiny little wire filament in an incandescent light bulb. Um, so we see differences in electricity as we would in water. One big kind of overarching category when we talk about resistance is defining things as conductors or insulators. And it isn't really a hard line to say that this is a conductor or this is an insulator. There's not just two categories, it's a spectrum. So some things are better conductors than others. But overall, we say that a conductor is something that has a low resistance. The best sort of conductors are typically metals. Um, gold and silver are actually the best conductors on the periodic table, but they are not really efficient is in terms of pricing. So we don't make wires out of gold or silver because that's far too costly for the amount of added benefit that those conductors have. Uh, instead, we use copper. Copper is kind of the sweet spot um, to give us a very low resistance, a really good conductor at a fairly cheap, uh, affordable price. An insulator is something with a high resistance. Um, typically the insulator of choice that wires are built out of is um, using like a rubber coating on the wires. So rubber or plastic is a really good insulator, which is why it's a good idea if you're ever working with electricity to wear rubber soled boots or shoes so you can insulate yourself from the ground and not have a very easy path to ground for the electrons to flow through. So in summary, these three properties, before we talk about their mathematical relationship, you should know um, pretty handedly. You should know that the voltage being potential difference has a symbol of V. Current is a symbol of I, that's the rate that charges flow. Resistance, how hard it is for the charges to flow is R. Now, uh, units will use volts, amps, and ohms. Now these are related to each other. Um, that these very basic definitions are useful for us to kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. But voltage, if you increase the voltage in a circuit, um, you are going to change the current as long as you're not changing anything else. If I hook up instead of a one and a half volt double A, I hook up a nine volt battery, I'm going to increase the current. Basically, if I increase the push, the rate at which the charges flow is going to increase as well because I'm pushing them harder through that circuit. If I increase the resistance, I make it harder for them to flow, but I keep the push the same, well, the current is gonna go down. Um, the way that we would describe these mathematically is that the voltage is uh, proportional to the current. So if one goes up, the other goes up. And resistance is proportional to the inverse of the current. If the resistance goes up, the current has to go down and vice versa. This is my favorite diagram depicting this relationship. <laughs> and it's kind of weird, but bear with me. The voltage is the push. Um, so the higher the voltage is, the, the stronger the push is trying to get these charges to flow through. So more push, the faster they get pushed. Um, resistance in ohms is making it harder for them to flow. So the larger the resistance, the slower the push. And you can see that relationship here in this sort of cartoon. Now, mathematically, this relationship is known as Ohm's law. Um, and it's often displayed in this triangle. Uh, I don't love the triangle, but it's, it's pretty common. So I wanna show you just what it looks like and why people would depict it this way. Ohm's law is basically Voltage is current times resistance. That's the relationship between volts, amps, and ohms. Um, this Ohm's law triangle, voltage on top and current times resistance on the bottom. If you cover up voltage to solve for that, you end up with current times resistance. If instead I cover up current, I end up with voltage divided by resistance. So I is V over R. And then if I cover up R 
resistance is voltage divided by current. Again, really all this is is just algebra, just a fancy way of finding that algebra. Um, but I expect from these equations, you should be able to calculate an unknown and solve for one of the others. The way this is given to you in your data booklet for IB is based on R. Um, it's the resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current. From this, you don't need an Ohm's law triangle. You can figure it out from there. We are going to be using Ohm's law a lot. This relationship is really important for solving circuits. So it's going to become second nature. I would encourage you to have this memorized in some form. Um, either resistance is voltage over current or V is equal to I times R and then solve for the unknown as needed. Now, here's a couple examples of what that might look like. What is the voltage of a battery that produces a current of one and a half amps through a three ohm resistor? One and a half amps is your current, three ohms is your resistance, and voltage is just current times resistance, I times R. One and a half times three gives you four and a half volts. So solving for the unknown. With that in mind, uh, go ahead and pause and solve for the unknown here. What resistance would produce a current of five amps from a 120 volt power source? All right, looking at the properties that we have, five amps is the current, that's I. 120 volts is the voltage. And then R is just voltage divided by current, which is 120 divided by five or 24 ohms. The fourth property that we need to talk about today is power. Power is gonna become even more important as we get into thermal physics and energy in the environment. But right now, power is related to these properties, so let's talk about it. Power, we've talked about before with a unit or a symbol of P and a unit of watts. Um, we talked about it before in terms of joules per second. That still holds true. Um, we'll get back into that energy unit a little bit later on. But right now, watts can be found through this equation as well. Voltage times current will calculate your power. Now, since we have different ways of find, finding voltage and current, there are some other forms of this equation. If I substitute in I times R instead of voltage, this equation turns into power is equal to I squared times R, the current squared times the resistance. That's just combining this equation with Ohm's law. Instead, if I take I being voltage divided by resistance and I substitute that in, power is equal to voltage squared divided by resistance. These three equations will all calculate for power. They just use different combinations of those other properties that we've referred to. In the data booklet for IB, uh, you are given all three variations on this, which is really unnecessary. You don't need all three. If you know Ohm's law as well, you can always solve for an unknown in two steps. But here you're given all three variations as needed. And an example of what this might look like is if you had a blender running on five amps of current, uh, you plug it into the wall, the wall in the US has a potential difference of voltage of 120 volts. How much power is it drawing? Well, we look at our equations here. The power is voltage times current um, or current squared times resistance or voltage squared divided by resistance. I'm given the current and the voltage, which means I'm just gonna use V times I. So the power is 120 times five, which is 600 watts, which is about 10 times the power of a standard 60 watt light bulb. Um, well, most light bulbs now, if they're LEDs, don't use actually 60 watts even. So this is quite a bit of power. You wouldn't want to have that on for a long time, but it's a blender, so you, you don't really have it on for a long time. Looking at some different devices on how that 600 watts uh, kind of adds up compared to some other things. Uh, a lot of things that are on for a long period of time don't actually use a ton of power. Obviously, obviously it certainly adds up if you're using lots of different devices in your home. But you'll notice here that there are some devices that use a lot of power. Um, and we are gonna circle back to this in our thermal physics unit because a common feature of all of these is heat, um, that these, are using a ton of power because it is using electricity to create heat and a lot of energy is needed to produce the heat that's required to run these different devices. Um, so we'll circle back to that uh, and turn this electrical 
uh, power into a thermal energy. So the key takeaways here, these four properties, voltage, current, resistance, and power, you should be able to describe them in a very general sense of what each of these are um, in terms of electricity, and then use Ohm's law and the power equation to mathematically relate these electrical properties and solve for an unknown. Uh, it's very rare in this unit that we're going to do that just on its own. Um, we're going to see these uh, mathematical relationships embedded into some circuitry and solving for circuits. So this, this is going to be part of a much larger problem as we go throughout this unit.